bueno, muy buenos días. Eh, nuevamente, dentro del marco de celebración de los 50 años del Departamento de Biología Celular, es para mí un placer presentar al doctor Francisco Javier Quintana, quien es pro Professor of Neurology, Kukro Weiner, Distinguished Professor of Neuroimmunology at the Ann Romney Center for Neuro Neurologic Diseases at, Green, at the Birmingham, Brigham and Women's Hospital Harvard, at Harvard Medical School. Él va a presentar su segunda plática, el control, control of T-cell autoimmunity by dendritic cells. La mejor carta de presentación más que decir algo, fue la presentación del día de ayer. por invitarme aquí a los que estuvieron ayer por, por volver hoy. Entonces hoy lo que voy a hacer es, eh, vamos a hablar de, un, de inmunología también, eso es lo que nosotros hacemos, pero en particular uh, eh, enfocándonos en la respuesta inmune adaptativa. Y como ayer, de nuevo, prefiero darlo en inglés por el bienestar de todos. Um, so when we think about T-cell autoimmunity, right? One of the main questions is, what is it that balances the differentiation, right, of effector cells that are going to potentially uh, promote tissue damage, and at the same time, regulatory cells, which, among other things, they're going to interfere with the activity and differentiation of effector, of effector teeth. So we do know that at the core of that process, at the core of the differentiation of effector and regulatory cells, are actually dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are hematopoietic immune cells. There actually are several subsets of dendritic cells, PDCs, CDCs, CDC1, CDC2, CDC2A, CDC2B. I'm going to try to stay away from those subsets just to simplify and make it easier for those that are really not that deep into neurons. But one all observation, I mean, one classic observation, is that actually in response to different stimuli, Dendritic cells can either promote the differentiation of effector cells, which in the context of autoimmunity, we're going to think they're going to promote pro-inflammatory responses. Obviously, those are the same responses that protect us against pathogens, against tumors. And in the context of autoimmunity, under certain circumstances, right, in response to different stimuli, dendritic cells are going to um, um, promote the differentiation of regulatory T's. That has led, and if you read about it, about people talking about these tolerogenic dendritic cells, my view on the subject is that that seems to be an activation status. So far, I don't think there's strong data suggesting that there's a specific dendritic cell population which is characterized by specific surface markers and differentiation partners, uh, pat, uh, programs that are involved in suppressing effector responses. I do think, though, that there are specific pathways that potentially operate in order to actually control this balance within the dendritic cells. In other words, to control the ability of the dendritic cells, for example, to produce cytokines that can either promote or suppress adaptive T cell immunity. And with that in mind, actually, one of the goals of my lab has been to identify molecular mechanisms that regulate this ability of dendritic cells to promote effector or regulatory T cell responses. And I'm going to show you two studies, and each one has its own motivation. The first one is actually um, fishing for regulators of T cell autoimmunity, and as you might infer from my talk yesterday, it's because it was initiated actually in zebrafish. And the idea was actually to address a basic question in immunology, which we hinted about yesterday, which is the fact that this is, for example, multiple sclerosis, and this is some of our work in this area, we do know that for someone to develop an autoimmune disease, you obviously need the right or the uh, permissive genetic background, but that genetic background actually has to be somehow elicited in response to environmental factors. And those environmental factors could be infections. Yesterday we talked about a uh, Epstein-Barr infection, those could be, for example, exposures or changes in the gut microbiome and the diet. And also that's 
could potentially be exposure to pollutants, right, to environmental chemicals. And there's a lot of data about that. I think one of the nicest examples I like is about migrants. And you can see that people that with a very specific background, right, when they move from dirtier environments, let's say from India to the UK or from South America to Europe, right, when they move to those cleaner environments, there is a significant increase in the development of autoimmune diseases, even when the genetic background has not changed. And that usually there's a very nice a background, uh, there's a very nice timing around that because it's usually around the age of 18 years when, you know, if you move, you can affect your chances of developing or not autoimmune disease. But that actually poses quite a difficult question, right? If we are going to assume that autoimmunity is the result of genes, because obviously there are mutations on specific genes, right, that are going to drive or to promote the, for the development of T cell autoimmunity. Those genes, we can study them quite well, right? Like now, there are all these genome sequencing programs. You can sequence whatever, and then you can identify SNPs. Let's say SNPs associated to IL-2 receptor, IL-2 production, FOXP3, whatever, that might somehow be associated with the development of autoimmunity. That's kind of like we can do, we can study that in a systematic manner. Now, the question is, how can we do, how can we apply the same type of systematic study in order to understand what are the environmental factors that affect T cell autoimmunity. And that's not a trivial question, right? Like the way it is usually done is by epidemiological studies. So somehow someone has pinched, right? A gut feeling about the candidate uh, environmental factor, and that could be vitamin D, that could be the gut flora, that could be exposure to pollutants or to sunlight. And then, you know, once you have a candidate, you can design a cute and nice, a well-controlled epidemiological study in order to address whether that specific epidemiological factor has an effect or not in autoimmunity. But the question or the challenge we wanted to address is how do you come up with some kind of unbiased study in order to identify environmental factors that can affect, for example, effector and regulatory T cell differentiation? And why is that important? First of all, if you identify new environmental factors, then it can be a new source, right? It can guide new epidemiological studies centered around environmental factors you haven't thought about. And then if you identify, you know, any environmental factor, if it is a chemical, right, it has to act through a specific signaling pathway. Hence, you might use those studies also, or you might use those environmental factors as probes to identify novel uh, signaling pathways, which you haven't thought about, that are involved in the regulation of effector and regulatory T cell responses. And this is actually the motivation behind the studies I'm going to present. And actually, yesterday, I show you some of that data, uh, kind of like showing it from the very end, which is the idea that we ran that study in a model of CNS inflammation, right? In this case, in a model of astrocyte-driven CNS pathology. And we identified some uh, environmental factors that can trigger CNS inflammation, but then we use them to identify this pathway we discussed yesterday where sigma-1 signaling triggers XBP1 activation. That was great, but that was from the, if you think as an immunologist, right, that was a model driven by innate immunity. There were no T cells involved, and that's something that we wanted to address. How can we study T cells in a zebrafish, and again, do it in a high throughput manner because I literally have done that. You don't want to inject thousands of zebrafish embryos with an autoantigens in order to trigger autoimmunity. That's way too heterogeneous. That's, that's just not going to work. So in order to address that, we decided to focus on a model of T cell autoimmunity that actually targets the gut. And in a second, I'm going to tell you what. And in particular, we decided, as you know, uh, gut inflammation or inflammatory bowel disease is actually a serious condition that affects billions of people around the world. It's actually pretty debilitating because, again, there's a need for new therapies. Those that actually stop responding to classic therapies such as TNF blockers or integrin blockers eventually might undergo or might have to undergo, you know, tissue resection in order just to function. The important thing about that is that actually there are very good models of T cell driven autoimmunity in the gut. And even better, there are T cell models that are, they are basically induced by uh, small molecules that when actually given to mice, 
they attach to antigens, then the antigen changes its conformation, is recognized as non-self, and then it triggers an autoimmune response. One of those molecules is actually called TMBS, and what is even better is that actually that model had been established in zebrafish. What we did then was actually to take that model and adapt it for it to work in older zebrafish, so we can surely demonstrate that this is T cell dependent. And this is something of what you can see. You make your embryos, right? These are actually five embryos per well in 96 well plate. And then you actually make them swim in this molecule called TMBS. They eventually develop gut inflammation. You can quantify that if you use, for example, T cell reporters, right, with GFP in order to monitor T cell recruitment to the gut. You can also monitor that if you analyze peristaltic movements, if you analyze even the widening, right, and the loss of the strips, the gut, and there's ways to quantify that in an automated manner. But obviously, you can go to classic immunological uh, methods, such as, for example, quantifying T cell and innate immune cell cytokines. And as you can see here, we can first of all uh, trigger or up trigger or, or upregulate the expression of IL-17, interferon gamma, classic markers of adaptive autoimmune T cells, and on top of that, some kind of non-adaptive uh, but classic innate cytokines or pro-inflammatory molecules such as NOS2, which catalyzes the production of NO and IL-1 beta. So we established this model. I won't show you the data, but actually we generated RAC knockout uh, zebrafish in this case, RAC1 and RAC2 knockouts to demonstrate that really this model is T cell dependent. So with that in mind, okay, we have a system, right? How can we now go and screen in an, in an unbiased manner for small molecules, for environmental chemicals in particular, that's what we decided to focus on, that might have an effect in the development of, in this case, T cell gut autoimmunity. So in order to do that, we actually collaborated with the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. And in particular, they have an asset that we thought would be very interesting, which is they have a collection a data set which is called Toxcast, which is basically a collection of about 10,000 environmental molecules that are thought to be part of the exposome, right? Molecules we are exposed to every single day because they are food preservatives, because they are herbicides, because they are fire retardants, you name it. The important thing about those is that they have not only their chemical structure, they have not only their exposure level, they also have established a library where they have run them in a library of about a thousand different biological essays. And those essays could be, for example, the activation of transcription factors. Okay, so they have reporter libraries where they have tested each one of these molecules. So this, that's a very rich data set, right? It's basically 10,000 molecules, each one analyzed in about a thousand different data sets. So we thought that would be a great starting point. Then the question is how do we extract from their molecules or, or, or exposures that would be useful to us. So we decided basically to combine, and I'll tell you in a second how we did it, to combine what is known about the genetics of IBD with some artificial intelligence. And in particular, what we did is the following. We started with this Toxcast uh, database, right? Which is about 9,000 chemicals, 10,000, it depends how you count them, run on about 1,500 bioassays. The first thing we did is since we know what are the candidate targets of each one of these chemicals, we decided to focus on targets that had been associated to the genetics of inflammatory bowel disease. As an example, nf kappa -B is a known gene associated with increased chances of developing inflammatory bowel disease. So obviously we grabbed all of those compounds that would somehow modify nf kappa -B signaling. And we did so with all the other genes that we could find. Then that resulted in about a thousand chemicals based or, or monitored in about 50 bioassays. So that obviously is a simple, simpler data set to work with. And then what we did is actually we prioritized those exposures, exposures based on how abundant they are in the environment. You know, how used, how, what are your chances of being exposed? How frequently are they used? Are there, you know, kind of legacy molecules that no one is working with? So that led us to about 110 chemicals, which basically we screened in our zebrafish assay at about four different concentrations in order to really be able to demonstrate a dose response of their ability to induce or suppress uh, inflammatory bowel disease in the zebrafish. 
that basically identified 30 chemicals that we use to build, that we actually analyze with artificial intelligence to build a classifier, to build a predictor that would actually look at a chemical and tell you this is likely or unlikely to boost or suppress gut inflammation. That led us to basically identify 20 candidates. And out, out of those, the one that we decided to focus, these are the candidates here, and they are uh, herbicides, they are fungicides. Some of them are actually even uh, flame retardants. But we decided to focus in particular on this chemical called propizamide, because it's highly, it's, it's actually used quite abundantly. It's actually used in lots of uh, uh, sport in order to control, her, you know, to control the growth of stuff you don't want to be around. It's also used actually for agricultural production. So obviously that's even more concerning. It's also used in everyone's garden. But we thought that's a good reason for us to focus on that one. And here, kind of like the project divides, right? On the one hand, you could say, and that's not what we do, you know, this is actually a list of good candidates to monitor and further investigate in epidemiological studies. But now what we can do is actually to get deeper into trying to understand how is it that propizamide can worsen, in, can worsen gut inflammation? Can we use it to identify novel pathways regulating gut autoimmunity? First thing we did was actually to analyze the uh, effect of propizamide in multiple dose response studies. And to cut it short, we were able to show that it can actually boost the production of effector uh, T cell cytokines, for example, IL-17, interferon gamma. And we were able to show that if we use rack knockout fibrofish, then we cannot boost gut inflammation by propizamide. So really, this is a T cell dependent effect. That's nice. But obviously, the main concern and our main focus is to identify molecules and pathways that are relevant for mammalian immunology. That's what we want to do. Hopefully, we wanted to understand human autoimmunity. So the first thing we did was actually to use the very same model, and that's actually why we use TMBS, because literally that's a model that works both in zebrafish and mice. And we decided to check the effect of uh, TMBS and, and propizamide in TMBS-induced gut inflammation now in mice. So when you treat um, a B6 mice with TMBS, you know, they lose weight. And that loss of weight is associated with the expansion of effector T cells, IL-17 producing and interferon gamma producing. Now, if we treat those mice with TMBS and propizamide, that weight loss is stronger. There's actually a significant and even more increased a shortening of the, the colon because this is like it's a colon, the large intestine. The more inflamed the colon gets, the shorter it gets. And then if we actually go and analyze blindly the histopathology of those, of those um, guts, we can see a significant worsening of histopathology by propizomide. And also we can see a significant expansion of interferon gamma producing, IL-17 producing CD4 T cells, and also CD8 T. So this molecule somehow is boosting gut inflammation. And then what we thought is, OK, that's very nice. As I said, it could be, then it, that could be a nice project for someone interested in epidemiology. But now we can use this molecule as a probe in order to understand or identify novel targets or novel mechanisms involved in the regulation of gut inflammation. And honestly, when we got there, we had no clue in terms of how this could be working. So what we did was actually to treat mice with bacal or propizamide run RNA-seq and basically see which pathways turned out to be mostly deregulated. And what was interesting to us was that there were three main genes that were associated with the genetic gene expression perturbations associated to treatment with propizamide, and one of, them, one of them was an old friend. Specifically, what we found, and this is just uh, a bioinformatic prediction at this time, what we found is that a transcription factor called AHR, which I'm going to talk about soon, was actually predicted to act as a negative regulator of a pathway by which NF-kappa B was driving the expression of this gene called CVPB. What is important about it is that both NF-kappa B and CVPB have been previously associated to genetics IBD. And indeed, although we know a lot about NF-kappa B, there was no real 
understanding about how is it that CBPB could be contributing to T cell inflammation in human inflammatory bowel disease. So the first experiment we did was actually to try to validate that and to cut it short. If we actually treat mice with propisamide, we actually were able to show that that triggers the upregulation of RELA, which is basically NF-kappa-B, and CBPB. Both genes seem to be upregulated in response to propisamide uh, treatment. So how could that be, this be working? And as I said, one of these genes is an old friend. It's a well-known regulator of immune responses. Indeed, that was literally at the focus of, of what turned out to be the first paper of my lab many years back, when we're using zebrafish in order to identify regulators of uh, effector and regulatory T cell differentiation. And those studies, and, and again, that came out from a zebrafish screen, led us to identify the aryl hydrocarbon receptor as a candidate pathway mediating this balance. What is the AHR? The aryl hydrocarbon receptor, the AHR, is a ligand activated transcription factor. When inactive, it sits in the cytoplasm complex with a lot of other proteins, HSP90, so on and so forth. However, once AHR interacts with its ligands, it undergoes a, a conformational transformation, it translocates into the nucleus, and there it controls the expression of target genes. And as I mentioned, we have shown over the years that this is very important for the differentiation of effector and regulatory cells through multiple mechanisms, and that operates not only in the context of autoimmunity, but also in the context of cancer immunity or in the context of immune responses to parasites and um, pathogens such, such as, for example, viral infection. The other thing that is very important is that we and others have shown that this pathway AHR is actually reactive or constantly activated by small molecules produced by metabolism, by small molecules produced by the gut flora, by small molecules produced or provided by the diet. So this is one of the pathways that we and others have shown operates really to balance effector and regulatory responses to control inflammation. So this is a pathway that came out in our studies. So just to, we then we went back and actually we validated these findings this time in single, this time in single cell RNA-seq because we were, with the first question we wanted to address was, is it operating, operating in the T cells directly or in dendritic cells, which would then modify T cell responses? And in short, the answer is in both. If we analyze T cells, right, of mice uh, treated with propisamide, we detected a significant downregulation of the AHR pathway and a significant upregulation of pro-inflammatory transcriptional pathways. We now do the same with dendritic cells, and, as, and you don't have to worry about that, but we actually focused on CDC1, CDC2s, and PDCs just to see which specific flavor of dendritic cell could be most affected by this. We detected that both CDCs, CDC1s, and CD, CDC2s had a significant downregulation of AHR signaling in response to propisamide uh, treatment concomitant with a significant upregulation of pro-inflammatory response. So now, how is it that propisamide could somehow be impacting AHR signaling, which in, in IBD in particular has been shown to be anti-inflammatory? Is we have detected that AHR signaling in uh, propisamide-treated mice was done regulated, the first hypothesis we had was, well, probably somehow it's inhibited AHR signaling by some mechanism we, do, we don't know. So the experiment we ran was pretty simple. We treated dendritic cells or T, or, or, or T cells, both mice and humans, with an AHR activator. Remember that AHR is a ligand activated transcription factor. And then we dropped propisamide on it and saw whether, and tried to see whether propisamide could either boost or downregulate AHR signaling. And to cut it short, this is the signal you get with a classic AHR activator, such as FITSI. If we add propisamide to it, we can significantly decrease AHR activation. And we can see these are two classic genes in the, in the mouse, in mouse dendritic cells. If we go to human dendritic cells, we get, the sim we get a similar observation. If we now go to T cells, the observations are pretty similar. We decrease AHR signaling triggered by its ligands by propisamide treatment, and that happens both, both in mouse and human T cells. 
So finally, what we try to address is how is it that propisamide is interfering with AHR signaling? Is it regulating AHR expression? The answer is not. AHR levels themselves were not affected, neither at the gene expression level nor the protein level. And then what we thought is, well, probably AHR is binding to propisamide itself. And indeed, in a series of competition studies, we were able to show that AHR directly binds, uh, that uh, propisamide directly binds to AHR and actually outcompetes one of its gold standard uh, uh, um, um, binders, such as dioxin. And that's interesting because we were able to validate that not only on human AHR, but also on mouse AHR. So from here, what we concluded is that actually propisamide directly interacts with AHR, and basically it works as an environmental antagonist that interferes with AHR anti-inflammatory responses. Now, the question is what comes underneath, right? I have mentioned that AHR, at least in our model, was predicted to interfere the, uh, to interfere with the expression of this transcription factor called CVPB, and that was actually driven by NF-kappa B. So what is CVPB? CVPB is a classic transcription factor. These, these and other members of this family of transcription factors have been associated with the regulation of immunological responses, and particularly in the context of IBD, it has been shown that CVPB was associated or mutations in CVPB were associated with an increased risk of IBD, yet the mechanism responsible for that was not known. So in order to address that, the first thing we did was actually to use CVPB deficient mice, and, 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 and that was actually pretty informative. If we take dendritic cells, which are deficient for CVPB, if we take, if we take wild type cells and we treat them with propisomide, we get a significant upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, right? IL-1 beta, TNF, IL-23, and I'm showing you the mouse data, the human data looks exactly the same. Now, if we use dendritic cells from CVPB deficient mice, right? Or if we inactivate CVPB in human dendritic cells with siRNAs, with T2, we, make, we made two specific observations. First of all, there's actually a significant, you know, you lose the effect of propisomide. Propisomide cannot boost anymore the production of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. But even more, CVPB deficiency actually interfered with the background, the base level production of pro-inflammatory cytokines by dendritic cells, suggesting that CVPB is not only responding to propisomide, CVPB is actually part of the pro-inflammatory response of dendritic cells. And this is what we're looking for pathways that are part of, of the classic inflammatory response and are just simply targeted and amplified by environmental factors such as CVPV. Now, what's the mechanism behind this observation? Basically, CVPV uh, binds to and transactivates the promoters of multiple cytokines involved with pro-inflammatory dendritic cell responses involved in the polarization of effector T. And again, that happens both in mice and humans. If we now go in vivo, because that was very interesting, right? Like our data suggested that CVPV was part of the pro-inflammatory response of dendritic cells, even in the absence of propisomide. If we go in vivo and actually we make mice with a specific deficiency of CVPV only in dendritic cells, and then we induce TMBS colitis in them, that results in a significant worsening of colitis. And if we actually analyze the T cell response of those mice in which CVPB has been specifically inactivated in dendritic cells, and hence these mice do better. I'm sorry, I just said it wrong, because the dendritic cells do not express CVPB. Then these mice have an, a, a decreased ability to trigger the differentiation of pro-inflammatory T cells. Indeed, if we sort out those dendritic cells, we use them as APCs, we just are not as good as in, at inducing effector T cells either in mouse or human. So that suggests that actually AHR limits uh, the activation of CVPV, and that's because propisamide directly interacts with it, and that CVPV promotes pro-inflammatory responses in the dendritic cell. So now the question is, what about CVPV signaling within T cells? Because there was even less known about that. And then we actually repeated very similar experiments. 
We took T cells deficient in CVPV, or actually as a control, we knocked down CVPV in T cells. And again, when we treat these T cells with propisamide, the control T cells, propisamide really boost the differentiation of effector T cells in vitro, interferon gamma producing TH1 cells, uh, IL-17 producing TH17 cells. But now if we inactivate CVPV, not only we abrogate the levels of propisamide, actually those T cells and the differentiation of those effector T cells goes below what we have seen in vehicle treated mice and in vehicle treated T cells in vitro, suggesting that CVPV also participates in basic pro-inflammatory responses of T cells. And indeed, through a series of experiments, we were able to show that actually CVPV transactivates not only the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, but actually the receptors involved with sensing cytokines that promote effector T cell differentiation. For example, it directly controls IL-12 receptor expression, as you can see here, and CVPV also controls faster regulators associated with effector T cell differentiation, for example, ROR gamma T. Now, how does that work? This is very similar to what I showed you before. CVPV, when activated, is recruited to the promoters of this IL-12 receptor, ROR gamma T receptor, and others. And once recruited, it transactivates them in order to promote their expression. This is in vitro. This also happened when we analyzed human T cells in vitro, so what about in vivo? So we now generated mice in which CVPV was only removed from T cells. And as you can see here, when we do that, we actually observe, we detect a significant amelioration of TMBS-induced colitis. And we got similar results in other colitis models. So what this suggests is actually CVPV is now part of the basic pro-inflammatory response that occurs in IBD in T cells. And that's simply boosted by propisamide. Propisamide was the tool for us to identify. And um, this amelioration, as I mentioned, is associated with decreased effector T differentiation. So now, so far I showed you data in zebrafish, right? We can treat with propisamide and boost, gut inflammation. We can do the same in mice, and then we can actually boost effector T cell differentiation, and we can boost gut inflammation, and those effects are mediated via AHR suppression and CVPV hyperactivation in T cells and dendritic cells. So what about humans? So in order to address that question, we analyzed by single cell RNA-seq about 50 patients, 50 IBD patients and controls, and we were able to analyze in them dendritic cells, T cells, and other cell populations such as ILC, so on. So the first thing we notice is that if we focus on the dendritic cells, there's a significant upregulation of CVPV expression in dendritic cells of IBD patients, and that's mostly restricted to the CDC1 dendritic cell population, and that might have implications in terms of how we might target it therapeutic. And then the second thing that I thought was interesting is that if we actually now sort out, right, like we focus on our transcriptional single cell RNA seq data set, and we isolate, we fish out from there the CVPV positive dendritic cells, those show a significant downregulation of AHR signaling and a significant upregulation of a bunch of pro inflammatory responses, suggesting that this really upregulation of CVPV in dendritic cells in patients is important for driving these pro inflammatory responses in dendritic cells in humans. What about T cells? Well, the results are pretty similar. Basically, we detected a significant upregulation of CVPV uh, expression in T cells from IBD patients. And if we now actually analyze, right, like we sort out from our single cell RNA seq data set, uh, CVPV positive T cells, those show a significant downregulation of AHR signaling and a significant upregulation of pro inflammatory responses, for example, those driven by interferon gamma and IL-17. So to summarize this part of my talk, basically what I showed you is that not only in mice and in zebrafish, basically in humans, we were able to identify this uh, signaling pathway, right, by starting with a very basic observation, which is how is it that environmental factors can control gut inflammation. We were able to define this novel pathway 
by which AHR actually operates under homeostatic conditions in order to suppress the NF-kappa-B driven expression of CVPB. And propisamide interferes with that and is an interesting example of how pollutants, how environmental chemicals could potentially interfere with homeostatic mechanisms that operate there to arrest inflammation. So now the question is, how can we target that therapeutically, right? So these findings suggest that AHR signaling within dendritic cells is important for controlling this balance between effector and regulatory cells. So there are two approaches we have taken. One approach is pretty, is pretty straightforward. It's basically to build nanoparticles that deliver an activator of AHR. In particular, we used activators uh, associated with the uh, mucosal uh, epithelia because those are associated, those tissues are associated with induction of regulatory cells. And in particular, what we have done is we have used a technology, an analiposome technology similar to the one used for the Moderna vaccines and the Pfizer vaccines, which uh, allows us to basically not only deliver AHR activators, but also to co-deliver an antigen of interest. And why is that? Because then we can induce a tolerogenic phenotype in these dendritic cells, so they will boost the differentiation of T-Rex uh, at the expense of effector T cells. But since these dendritic cells are actually overloaded with self-antigens, we can do that in an antigen-specific manner. And that's important because then we can actually induce very specific and focalized uh, tolerogenic responses against self-antigens without interfering with tumor immunity, so on and so forth. So this is one approach we exploded. But the other approach we explored is actually focusing again on targeting the gut and targeting gut inflammation in the gut using or exploring the gut flora. And in particular, one approach I'm going to show here is actually playing with the idea of can we build synthetic probiotics that will basically sense inflammation and react to it? And if we want to do so, how do we do it? And this is what I'm going to share with you in a minute. And as a platform, right, as a chassis, in this first approach, we decided to use yeast. Why did we use yeast? Yeast, as you know, is an eu eukaryotic. So first of all, it allows us to engineer better circuits to sense and respond. And on top of that, it allows us to produce better or more elaborate, elaborated uh, therapeutic proteins. We can now think about enzymes that because yeast are eukary eukaryotes, then can have all the post-translational modifications for them to be functional. Or we can also think, and we are indeed working with uh, antibodies, for example, TNF blocking antibodies. So, so how does that work? What we decided to do was actually to decide or focus on what can we sense in the gut that could be a good marker of inflammation, right? How can we know, because the gut is super long, how can we identify those specific foci where there is an inflammatory response? Because that's actually how the IBD gut looks like. You don't have the whole gut inflamed, you have very specific regions. So in order to do so, we decided to, to base on literature from our lab and other labs, which has shown that actually extracellular ATP is associated with inflammation. We all know about ATP being produced by the mitochondria and that being an important uh, currency in, 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 in energy within the cell. The important thing is that inflamed tissues show an increase of extracellular ATP. And where is that extracellular ATP coming from? First of all, immune cells, when they're activated, and I'm talking about T cells, I'm talking about dendritic cells, macrophages, uh, mast cells, when they're activated, they have specific channels, annexings, and so on and so forth, that I'm going to release extracellular ATP from within the cell to the extracellular medium. In the context of IBD, that's even further amplified because this biosis actually selects for uh, uh, microbiome components that actually produce extracellular ATP. And on top of that, there are specific mutations in IBD patients that actually further amplify extracellular ATP level. Why is that important? Because that extracellular ATP is not only a marker of sites, that extracellular ATP is actually sensed via specific receptors, for example, a P2X 
uh, 7 receptor, the P2Y2 receptor, and that actually not only marks inflammation, it further amplifies and promotes inflammation. And it's that it does so through multiple effects, extracellular ATP boost, uh, dendritic cell uh, pro-inflammatory responses boost, mast cell responses, and even extracellular ATP signaling on T cells directly, promotes this activation, activation, promotes effector T cell responses, and interferes with the differentiation function and stability of regulatory cells. Both FOXP3 T-Rex and TR1 cells, which as you know are FOXP3 negative, yet they produce IL-10. So we thought this is a nice target. We can, if we can come up with a bug, right, that can sense extracellular ATP and produce a molecule that depletes it, that might be an interesting way of thinking about synthetic probiotics. And that led us to think or come up with the idea of coming with these probiotics that we jokingly call uh, Y-bots or yeast robots. Here we go. Opa. Okay, it's only one. Ah, no, pero igual el... O sea, espera hasta que se arranque o seguimos. Ok, mientras. ¿Alguien tiene preguntas de la primera parte de la presentación? We build these things that we jokingly call Y robots, right? These robots or Y bots. And the idea was actually to build a platform where we could literally program the ability to sense whatever we want to sense and produce a therapeutic molecule in a very controlled manner. And in basically, this is what is shown here to sense markers of inflammation and produce a therapeutic output in a localized manner. And in order to do so, the first thing we did was actually to co-opt a well-known pathway that operates in yeast. Basically, yeast has a, have a very interesting mating process by which they sense soluble factors, soluble protein factors, and then in response to a signaling pathway, which doesn't matter, they will express genes associated with, uh, with mating. So what we did is we actually co-opted that specific pathway, and this is what we did. First of all, we replaced the receptor, which is at the top here, uh, and instead of having a yeast sensor for a mating factor, we actually put there the human P2Y2 receptor, which is a receptor for extracellular ATP. The thing is that we actually applied in vitro evolution and synthetic biology, I won't get into that, First of all, to, to increase the affinity of that receptor, so we would sense the levels of extracellular ATP present in the inflamed human gut. That's the first thing we did. We also actually uh, established this in vitro evolution model, so we would select 
for receptors that would be stable in the yeast. Remember, this is a receptor that obviously evolved to be expressed in human cells, and so it would actually interact properly with the downstream signaling pathway. And now, the second thing that was associated with the detection of inflammation now to engineer a therapeutic response, basically what we took is there's a whole family of proteins which are called apirases. We take extracellular ATP, they degrade it, so that per se would be great, right, because you are removing the pro-inflammatory response. But these apirases are even better because they take the extracellular ATP and they turn it into adenosine, which is a strong anti-inflammatory molecule. So basically we screened for apirases and we ended up finding that the apirase from potato is actually the best one to express in. Then we have a system which theoretically senses extracellular ATP, and only when and where it senses extracellular ATP as a marker of inflammation, going to produce this anti-inflammatory molecule called apirase. So how does that work? We validated it in a million different ways, but I think this is a nice example. We actually built a bag just to monitor the system that instead of expressing apirase, expresses M-cherry. And then what we did, we had naive mice, and we have mice where we induce colitis with TMBS. And if you remember, I have said before that uh, TMBS colitis only targets the colon. It doesn't affect the small intestine. So if we feed these bugs, right, if we feed these Y-bots into naive mice, the bugs circulate through the gut and the system never gets activated. They just don't sense inflammation, they don't sense extracellular ATP increase, nothing happens. Now, if we feed them into mice with TMBS-induced colitis, they almost have no activation in the small intestine. But the moment, the moment the bugs get to the areas of the gut that are actively inflamed, then the, cir the circuit is turned on, and they start to produce whatever they want. So how does that work now when instead of having m cherry, we actually produce an anti-inflammatory molecule here? So first of all, if we actually dose those, uh, those mice in which we have induced TMBS colitis, we can induce a strong uh, amelioration of the disease. If we compare that amelioration with drugs that are already in the clinic, ENF blocking antibodies or interpin blocking antibodies, these bugs are as good as those blocking antibodies. The advantage, though, is that when you treat patients with these blocking antibodies, since you are immunosuppressing systemically, you have an increased occurrence of malignancies, you have an in increased occurrence of opportunistic infections. These effects are not seen because you are only producing the anti-inflammatory uh, response where you detect inflammation. And that, by the way, is restraining the gut. It doesn't get inflammation. Now, if we characterize the immune response, we get a significant upregulation of regulatory T cells, producing IL-10, producing FOX3, a significant downregulation of pro-inflammatory T cells producing IL-17, producing interferon gamma, and also a significant downregulation of fibrosis. One of the problems associated with chronic inflammation in the gut is that patients develop stenosis, they develop fibrosis, and that has significant and massive impact on quality of life. And then one minor thing, I mean, it's not minor, actually, it's important, is the fact that we actually also uh, preserve and, and, and actually boost the expansion of members of the microbiome that are known to be anti-inflammatory and that are known to promote the differentiation of effective tumor. So to summarize this part of my talk, basically what I show you is I started showing how we can go from environmental factors into identifying novel pathways that regulate dendritic cells. And then I showed you how we have these Y-bots, which actually we validated in three additional models of inflammation, T-cell driven, innate immunity driven, targeting the large intestine, the small intestine, and which seem to be very specific in arresting inflammation. What we like about this uh, system, right, these Y-bots as we call them, is that they're actually a platform. That's why we use GIST here. So we're actually engineering additional sensors, right, associated with different forms of pathology and also additional effector molecules, molecules that can target additional anti-inflammatory pathways and also molecules that could potentially promote tissue repair. For example, you can think about IL-10. Since we're now using a eukaryotic system to produce these therapeutic cargos, we can really aim to produce this complex 
uh, eukaryotic molecules that many times are not properly expressed by bacteria. So that's the first uh, thing I wanted to share. And now I'm going to go into a more specific and simpler project, which is actually bringing that back to our approach, but now to have some remote control. How do we target the gut? How are adding a harvest training? And it all started, you know, if, if just going back to one slide I showed yesterday, we all know that as autoimmune T cells are induced in multiple sclerosis, they're induced in the periphery, they're actually reactivated in the CNS, and then those T cells will ca cause damage to axons and myelin. And we wanted to ask a very simple question, what are the mechanisms that regulate those dendritic cells within the CNS? And in order to address that question, we sucked mice at the peak of EIE, we sorted dendritic cells, we sorted these three classes I mentioned, and we did single cell rna -seq. And one thing that caught our attention was a significant upregulation of HIF-1 alpha signaling. We were able, and that was associated not so much with the resolution, but actually during the peak of the disease, suggesting that somehow could be involved in the regulation of that dendritic cell function. That was found also in the CNS and in the spleen of dendritic cells. So the question is, how is it, what is HIF signaling and how could it play and what role could it play in dendritic cells in the CNS? So what is HIF signaling? Basically, as you know, the, this is basically a signaling pathway that has been initially identified because it senses low levels of oxygen. This is the classic mechanism we all have to sense hypoxia, but like with many other pathways, it's also triggered by additional stimuli, right? In this specific case, it has been shown that extracellular TP or metabolites, succinate, for example, can actually trigger the activation of this transcription factor called HIF. And once HIF is activated, it can actually drive the expression of multiple uh, gene targets. So that's what was known. So the first question we wanted to ask is, what is the role of HIF, if any, in dendritic cells in the context of EIE? So to address that question, we ran a simple experiment. We actually generated a conditional knockout, specifically in activating HIF in EIE, in dendritic cells, we induced EIE. And as you see here, when we do that, that results in a significant worsening of EIE. And indeed, if we analyze the transcriptional responses of those dendritic cells, they are really deregulated, they are really pro-inflammatory. So to cut it short, what this suggested is that HIV signaling was somehow being activated in dendritic cells, and it was operating in the context of inflammation in order to suppress pro-inflammatory dendritic cell responses. And then one thing that caught our attention, and I think it's interesting, we'll get back to that, is that when HIV was deleted from these dendritic cells, not only there was a significant upregulation pro inflammatory responses, there was a significant transcriptional signature associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. Somehow, if signaling in dendritic cells was controlling the mitochondria, and that might or might not be related with the ability to regulate dendritic cell response. So, the first question we wanted to address then was actually what is activating if in dendritic cells in the context of inflammation. They didn't think it could be uh, hypoxia, so we decided to go to metabolites because it has been shown that metabolites can also activate if signaling. And it is also known that in the context of inflammation, there's a deep re metabolic remodeling that dendritic cells undergo, and that has important implications for their function. So we screened multiple metabolites, as you can see here, and what we found was that L-lactate was the one that was able to trigger the highest activation of HIF in dendritic cells. Indeed, if we actually run a dose response, we can get a significant and quite efficient activation and stabilization of HIF in the presence of very low lactate levels. And then one thing I mentioned is that, as I said, dendritic cells undergo a deep metabolic remodeling in the context of activation, right, when activated. And one of the molecules that it's known and it's, it could be affected was actually lactate. So we decided to quantify its levels. And as you can see here, 
when we activate uh, if when we activate dendritic cells, there's a significant upregulation of lactate production, and that those lactate levels really fall within those detected in those that can activate HIP. So that suggested, and this and a series of experiments led us to show that when you activate dendritic cells, they produce lactate, and that can actually activate HIP signaling. So now the question we wanted to address is how is it that HIP signaling in dendritic cells would affect their ability to polarize effector or T cell responses or to control CNS inflammation? So if you remember, I have shown you that actually one of the strongest signatures that we detected in those dendritic cells in which we inactivated HIF was a transcriptional signature associated with the uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. So the first thing we did was actually to screen for mitochondrial genes that would be regulated by HIF. And what we found was a significant ability of HIF to really transactivate, as you can see here, the expression of a, of a molecule called Endufa. If it's actually recruited to the promoter of Endufa 4L2, and I'll tell you in a second what that is, you can trigger its expression. If you inactivate HIF, you can decrease the levels of Endufa 4L2. And actually, if you take dendritic cells and treat them with L-lactate, which is what mammals produce, or if you also treat them with D-lactate, which is what the microbiota produces, both forms, both isomers, of lactate can actually trigger Endufa expression. So what is Endufa 4L2? So Endufa 4L2 is actually an alternative member of the respiratory chain. And basically, it operates as a break to really stop the migration of electrons through the, uh, through the uh, respiratory chain. And by doing so, it actually suppresses the production of reactive oxygen species. It suppresses the production of empty rods. So the first thing we did was actually then to inactivate Endufa, specifically in dendritic cells. And what we see is that when we do so, there's a significant uh, actually uh, boost in the respiratory activity of dendritic cells. But then that results in a significant boost of empty rose production. And if we actually treat those dendritic cells with lactate, we can suppress the respiratory chain. We can actually suppress um, empty rose production. And again, that suppression is endufa dependent. So we thought that would be interesting. And then actually we interrogated whether that would have an effect on molecules we really care about, right? On cytokines associated with the ability of dendritic cells to promote effector regulatory T cell differentiation. And to cut it short, what we found is that actually L-lactate can strongly suppress the expression of cytokines associated with the differentiation of effector T cell responses. You can see here IL-6, IL-23, IL-12. And what is interesting about that is that the ability of lactate to suppress effector T cell, cytokines that promote effector T cell responses in dendritic cells is actually dependent on Endufa 4L2. If we inactivate that gene, that effect is lost. So why is that important? Because if we, take, if we throw T cells into these dendritic cells, if we inactivate Endufa in dendritic cells, we can actually suppress actually their ability to, uh, we can actually exacerbate the production of effector T cells. The last question we wanted to address is how on earth is it that the regulation of forward electron transfer, right? How is it that the regulation of energy generation, its suppression, and consequently, the suppression of empty rose production could affect T cell differentiation? And that's something we got stuck for a while until uh, there was a very interesting publication that showed that uh, empty rose can actually stabilize XBP1, the very same transcription factor I spoke about today. And by doing so, can actually promote the expression of pro-inflammatory genes in cytokines. And to cut it short, what we found is that basically empty rows, whose production is actually limited by Endufa, can promote, is recruited to multiple uh, promoters associated with the expression of IL-6, IL-23, so on and so forth, and can transactivate them, and by doing so, can promote the differentiation of effector T cells. 
And just to show how this operates in vivo, if we now generate a conditional mouse where we inactivated XBP1 specifically in dendritic cells, there's a significant amelioration of EIE, and that goes or that results in a significant suppression in the production of effector T cell response. So that is nice. So that's a nice pathway, right? We have if one alpha that senses lactate, and then that somehow slows down the mitochondria, and that slows down the activation of XBP1, and decreases the production of cytokines that promote effector T cell response. That is all nice. The question is, how can we target that therapeutically? And why is it that I'm asking that? Because you cannot give lactate to patients. Because lactate is known to induce something called uh, lactate acidosis, which is obviously wrong for many reasons that has important uh, neurological consequences. The question is, how can we activate this pathway? How can we provide additional lactate in a way that could be therapeutically relevant? And by then, what was known and was shown by multiple investigators was that actually that T cells that are going to cause autoimmunity in the CNS, in the pancreas, whatever autoimmune disease you want, those T cells are actually educated and they sit at the gut. Basically, if you actually induce EIE with by immunization, the T cells are going to go from the lymph nodes to the gut. They're going to be modulated by the gut flora and then go to the CNS. The question we wanted to address is, can we target the pathogenic T cells as they transit to the CNS? And the question is how we can do it. So again, if we give lactate orally, that's a mess because we will never reach the amounts we want, particularly in the small and the large intestine where there is this effect of So to address that, what we did was actually to again build synthetic probiotics, but in this specific case, we decided to use E. coli. And in particular, we use a strain of E. coli that has been used as a probiotic for years. It's one of those things that you can buy in some uh, Trader Joe's and some supermarkets, at least in the US, which has low yet safe anti-inflammatory activity. What is even more important is that there are already three clinical trials where these specific probiotics, the Nisle strain of E. coli, has been used in order to provide enzymes in order to ameliorate human diseases. Modified probiotics based on this specific bag have actually, are actually now in phase two. We thought this is a great platform for us to engineer. And basically what we did is two things. We inactivated a gene in the, in the, in the bacterial chromosome, and we also overexpressed one gene. So now these uh, bacteria become and they, they, they are turned into a lactate factory. They can increase lactate levels in the gut when we treat them, and when, we quant when we treat mice with these uh, bugs, we detect a significant increase in the gut, but not into the systemic circulations. They're very localized. We played one trick for safety, which is to put this pathway under the, under the control of a temperature sensitive promoter. And why is that? because then this bag is going to be functional only when at the gut, when only when at the 37 degrees that characterizes, uh, uh, that characterize a mammal. Once released, this bag is deactivated and then we induce a lot of other uh, mutations which are important for us and for the FDA to feel comfortable about them. And this is actually some of the data where we can show that if you treat these, uh, if you take these bags, right, and you put them at 37, they immediately start producing uh, lactate. And what is important, remember, they produce the lactate. That's what bacteria make, not produce L lactate. But we have shown that both of them are equally functional in inducing these anti-inflammatory dendritic cell responses. So we generated this back. Now we can feed it into mice. And to cut it short, when we feed them into mice, we can activate HIF-1 signaling in dendritic cells in the gut both in the small and the large intestine. We can upregulate and do expression, and we can actually suppress XBP1 activation. And indeed, if we sort these dendritic cells and we analyze them by RNA-seq, we see a significant, we detect 
a significant decrease in these dendritic cell pro-inflammatory response. That's nice, we're targeting the pathway we wanted to target. What about their function? So if we treat mice with these bugs and we can treat them even once a week, and that's still beneficial, we uh, can get a significant suppression of EIE. And that suppression is completely abrogated when we treat not wild-type mice, but mice with a specific de deficiency in HIF-1 alpha in dendritic cells. In other words, the functional this amelioration of EIE is driven by the activation of HIF-1 alpha in dendritic cells. And obviously, this amelioration is detected or correlates with a significant decrease of pro-inflammatory responses in the CNS. The last question we wanted to ask, how are these two things connected, right? Like, we're giving a bug that is somehow operating in the gut, yet we're seeing a decrease in the pro-inflammatory responses in the CNS. We're seeing a decrease in T cells, not immune T cells that go to the CNS. So to address that, we actually went back to these publications that show that when you induce EIE, cells go to the gut, and from there they go first thing we did was actually to quantify T cell responses, specifically in the small intestine. The large intestine looks the same. And as you can see, when we treat with bugs that express lactate, not when we treat them with the control bugs, there's a significant decrease in TH1 and TH17 response. The last question we want to know is, are these the T cells that will home to the CNS? We're really interfering with those T cells that will in order to do that, we played a simple trick. We used mice which are called caede. These are mice that when you irradiate them to a specific site, you can actually turn the conversion of a green fluorescent protein into red. So you can do that with a laser and close the mouse. You can do it, for example, that, and indeed that's what we do. We do it one day, we close the mouse, and then we can come back one day, two days, a week later, and try to see where those cells that used to be in the, gut, in the gut have gone to. And to cut it short, then what we did is we actually treated mice with a control or the lactate producing bug. We treated them, we activated the caede, the red fluorescent protein specifically in the gut, close the mice, and a couple of days later we look at the CNS. And what we can see is that when mice are treated with bugs, with bacteria that produce lactate, there's a significant decrease in those T cells that were educated in the gut and now go to the those effector T cells. And we're actually interfering where, with the early maturation of these autoimmune T cells. And by now we know that this very same process can be applied to target inflammation in other tissues, even in the gut. But we were very interested in showing this very distal effect of targeting the gut and controlling CNS. But then just to summarize, basically uh, what I show you in this second story is that first of all, we identify this immunometabolic pathway by which when dendritic cells are activated, they undergo a remo uh, metabolic remodeling, they produce lactate, and then activates HIF-1 alpha, and that via Endufa suppresses empty rose production and the production of the activation of XVP1, which then drives effector tissue. And what is interesting is we were, able, we were also able to demonstrate that we can hyperactivate therapeutically this pathway with bugs that produce the lactate. And these are shown here. So then just to summarize what I show you today, first of all, we talk about the regulation of dendritic cells by this AHR, EBPV, NF-kappa-V signaling pathway. And I showed you how not only how this pathway uh, can be targeted therapeutically, not only by using nanoparticles, also by using these Y-bots, this kind of programmable uh, synthetic probiotics that we can uh, make, we can kind of program them to sense and react to inflammation. And then in the second part of my talk, we talk about this an immunometabolic pathway that controls gut inflammation, that controls dendritic cells, and how we can also generate synthetic probiotics in order to really activate this immunometabolic anti-inflammatory pathway and suppress inflammation. And with that, I want to finish, and I want to acknowledge, um, oh, no problem. Uh, I want to acknowledge Lily San Marco, 
which is the, the she, she drove these two projects together with Chun Chai Chao, Jessica Kenison, and others. So with that, thanks again for having me here for this couple of days, and I'm happy to take Muchas gracias. Preguntas. Francisco, muchas gracias por esta eh, otra vez extraordinaria plática. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Este, una pregunta en la primera parte. Es, ministra Piraza, no nos dijiste que la, la, cuántas veces se administra la levadura, esta levadura recombinante ¿verdad? que produce la piraza, dado que se está administrando en un ambiente inflamatorio. ¿Se puede romper la tolerancia y llegar a producir anticuerpos neutralizantes que impidieran la actividad de la, de la piraza? Perfecto, es una muy buena pregunta. La, la, la forma en que diseñamos esos probióticos es con la idea de que se administra el, el Y-Bot todos los días. ¿Por qué? Porque básicamente si el paciente no tiene una respuesta proinflamatoria, el Y-Bot no se activa y es, es excretado. La pregunta entonces secundaria es si lo administras daily en el contexto de inflamación, ¿inducís anticuerpos bloqueantes? No. Y uno de los principales motivos es porque no hay translocación, se mantiene todo en el lumen, todo muy local. No, no atraviesa entonces. No, los efectos, y eso es muy importante para nosotros, sí, claro. creemos que es uno de los potenciales de la técnica. Una de las cosas que estamos haciendo es produciendo ahora anticuerpos bloqueantes, anti-TNF y anti-integrins, pero la ventaja es que se mantienen todavía en el lumen. Entonces no haces trigger de systemic immunosuppression. Pero en cambio, en el otro modelo de coli, ahí sí el lactate atraviesa. Sí y no. ¿Por qué? Sí, atraviesa. Pero las cantidades, la, la diferencia es que las cantidades que atraviesan son insignificantes comparados con los niveles endógenos del lactate de circulación. Donde realmente tenés un incremento significativo en los niveles de lactate es en el tejido de carne, no en el sistema. Y entonces ahí en el tejido, esta disminución de las productoras de interferón gamma que viajan al sistema nervioso central, ¿qué sucede en el balance? ¿no se diferencian y se quedan como TH0? ¿O viajan y en, eh, y en realidad tienen otro fenotipo y sí están en el sistema nervioso? Pasan dos cosas. Por un lado, no se diferencian. Claramente hay un efecto que inhibe la diferenciación. En el caso de las TH17, por ejemplo, se mantienen produciendo IL-10, que es un fenotipo antiinflamatorio que está asociado al gut tissue. Lo que también vemos y que estamos ahora tratando de caracterizar es vemos una inducción muy fuerte de TR1 cells, que son las FOXP3 negative IL-10 positive cells. Entonces, creemos que on top de ese efecto inhibidor de la respuesta uh, efectora, estamos induciendo TR1 cells. No fuimos hasta ahora capaces de detectar que migran al CN. Entonces, es probable que se queden, sean parte de amplificar la generación de efectores en el caso. Y tolerancia. Ok, y ahora un poco más técnica, ¿El, ¿el modelo de EAE que utilizas es transgénico o es policlonal? ¿Qué modelo? El de EAE, el de experimental encefalitis. El de... Entonces, siempre son, son siempre eh, B6 background inmunizado con MOB35. Sí. Okay. Lo que sí tenemos es un montón de knockouts. Hoy, hoy mostré, por ejemplo, el okay. knockout para HIF, para XBP1. Para Endufa no hay knockout condicional. O sea, todos son policlonales. Pues. Claro. Y eso es muy importante, me parece, porque um, a pesar, obviamente, el 2D2 mouse, que es el modelo que no, es importante para monitor mock responses, hay datos que sugieren que la diferenciación y en tu efecto y regulatory cells might be biased si hace el efecto, por, eh, si usas el monoclonal. Por eso tratamos de usar el policlonal. Okay. Muchas gracias, Francisco, y gracias por la plática. Maravillosa. Fátima. Buenas tardes y muchas gracias, doctor, por sus conferencias. Eh, son muy inspiradoras para nosotros. Yo creo que 
en lo particular no tenía ni en el radar que existían ese tipo de tecnologías o técnicas que son actuales y que brindan tanta información. Entonces, muchas gracias por, por compartir con nosotros. Y mi pregunta es, bueno, yo en, en el laboratorio en donde estoy estudiando el doctorado, trabajamos con vías de señalización del HR. Entonces, eh, mi pregunta es en relación al HR y HIF 1 alfa. Eh, ambos factores de transcripción en sus vías de señalización comparten Arnold. al ARNT, ¿no? que es eh, su socio para funcionar ya como heterodímeros, como factores de transcripción. Entonces, ¿han considerado ustedes algún crosstalk que puedan tener esos dos factores de transcripción, dado que los dos, al parecer, actúan como anti, vías de señalización antiinflamatorias? Sí, es buenísima la pregunta. Y hay dos respuestas a eso. La primera es que en el 2015 o 2013, Publicamos en Nature Immunology cómo compiten ANT, eh, HIF y AHR por ANT para promover la diferenciación de TR1 cells. En base a eso, cuando encontramos estos resultados, mi predicción, y como muchas otras cosas en el laboratorio estaba equivocadísimo, era mi predicción era que inactivar HIF iba a tener el fenotipo opuesto. ¿Okay? Pensamos que, lo que yo pensaba era que HIF estaba out competing ANT from AHR. Y no, eso no ocurre. No entendemos bien por qué es que lo que sí vemos en T-cells, en dendritic cells, eh, no ocurre, pero esa era la predicción que experimentalmente no, no lo pudimos ver. Y, y te puedo asegurar que empujamos por eso y nos fijamos no solo en, hoy ni lo mostré, pero eh, usamos, hicimos muchos experimentos de human dendritic cells, donde estábamos activando HIV o AHR, uh, HIV or AHR y XVP y todo este pathway, y no, por algún motivo no estamos viendo ese crosstalk. No termino de entender por porque muchas veces como que la lógica nos dice, bueno, si lo comparten, activo uno, se va a inactivar la otra o viceversa. ¿no? Sí, pero por eso como que a veces data roots, ¿no? O sea, haces el experimento y si los controles están, eso es lo que es. El problema es nuestro en interpretarlo. Muchas gracias, doctor. Hola, Hola, Lisa. Bueno, otra vez muchísimas gracias por tan espléndida plática. Eh, pues yo te iba a preguntar lo que te preguntó Fati. <risa> eh, pero bueno, también me quedé pensando acerca de eh, la microbiota y la contribución en lo que se está provocando en estas enfermedades inflamatorias. Si, si ha habido o hay estudios en los que relacionen la composición de la microbiota, por supuesto, muy asociada al tipo de alimentación de las diferentes regiones, pero ya identificando qué tipo de microbiota, qué población son las que están aquí o allá, y se asocia con el IBD o esclerosis múltiple y otras enfermedades este, autoinmunes. Sí, eh, de hecho el, el, el primer estudio en, en MS es uno que hicimos en el, en el centro, no en el laboratorio, fue un multicenter, donde mostramos que hay perturbaciones, hay cambios en la microbiota en MS patients. Lo que nosotros mostramos después, fue que en particular en pacientes con MS, no sabemos cuál es la, la, la fuente, hay una disminución de, de la producción de HR agonis en, en, por el gut microbiome. Lo podemos detectar en, en, en sangre, lo podemos detectar en CSF. Eso fue publicado back to back con otro paper que mostró lo mismo en IBD. En el caso de IBD lo que mostraron, que hay una mutación en un receptor que se llama CAD9, que es importante para como el host sense la microbiota, que eso te cambiaba el patrón del microbioma y te realmente te, en IBD te, decrecía, te disminuía la frecuencia de productores de HR ligas. Los dos fueron publicados back to back. Um, no está claro, yo creo que en IBD las perturbaciones en la microbiota son mucho más fuertes que en MS. No sé bien, por, bueno, probablemente por una cuestión de proximidad, ¿no? Porque la, la microbiota está ahí al lado. Haciendo cualquier... Lo que sí es interesante es cómo activarlo de vía eh, terapéuticamente. Entonces, más allá de estos lactate producings que les mostré, generamos también un par de uh, bacterias que producen eh, AHR agonis, que son antiinflamatorios. Con la idea de decir, y un detalle que es muy importante es, cuando te fijas en el microbiome, la producción de HR agonis 
eso es un fe. Es terapia porque quiere decir que cada persona, de acuerdo a cuánto pavo comió ese día, va a tener más. Nosotros fue, hicimos, fue ingenierizar esta, estos packs para que la producción de echar algo ni fuera dependiente de glucosa. Ya levantó los Bueno, doctor, antes que nada, pues también eh, muchas gracias por las conferencias, eh, muy interesantes. La tecnología es como que, como dicen, <risa> inspiran mucho, yo creo que a todos. Eh, mi pregunta va dirigido precisamente a los metabolitos de la microbiota intestinal, estos metabolitos del triptófano. Eh, yo tenía entendido que sí podían atravesar la barrera mantoencefálica. Entonces, mi pregunta va dirigida de que, eh, ¿usted cree que el, la encapsulación o eh, estos metabolitos del triptófano eh, puedan usarse como tales, como un fármaco para que atraviese la barrera hematoencefálica y que a su vez re, tenga una respuesta antiinflamatoria a través de HR o a través de eh, esta producción de células eh, TRAX? Sí, nosotros de hecho mostramos eso, que hay, hay algunos metabolitos, de el, el, algunos hay echar agonis por control by the gut flora, que pueden atravesar la barrera hematoencefálica y Creo que alguien preguntó a ese control. Actúan directamente sobre microglía, astrocitos y su crosstop para, uh, damp, para apagar respuestas proinflamatorias. Obviamente, si los tenés en la circulación, también te van a suprimir eh, la respuesta inmune adaptativa. ¿Cierto? Pero bueno, tenés una contribución local. Ahora, la pregunta de si se pueden usar cómo están solos, ¿no? como, como, como droga. El año pasado se aprobó una droga que se llama tapir. Ah, se pensaba que eso, eso era un no, 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 porque estaba todo el temor de decir, bueno, ahí echar es el ligand por dioxin, right? Por TCDD. Entonces, eh, nadie tomaría dioxin. ¿Cuán peligroso podría ser administrar un activante mismo, que son completamente distintos en Half-Life y un montón de cosas? El año pasado la FDA aprobó la primer droga que hace activación de echar, y es una droga que se llama Tapinarov que básicamente se aprobó para psoriasis. ¿Por qué se aprobó para psoriasis? Porque se administra de forma tópica. Entonces, genera menos miedo en cuanto a, a cuánto va a la circulación. Sin embargo, sabemos que va a la circulación y aún así, si lo aplicas en forma tópica, va a la circulación y aún así uh, es uh, safe. Entonces, lo que estamos haciendo ahora es tratar de ver si se puede aplicar literalmente IBD, es el next step. Pensar en orden. Lo que yo pensaría a más largo plazo, pero eso es más logical thinking, es que siempre está el peligro entonces de generar un nuevo esteroide. ¿Y a qué me refiero con eso? Si terminás con un nuevo immunosuppressor que es no antigen specific, no sé cuán bueno puede ser. ¿Cierto? Porque está bien, vas a pagar la respuesta autoinmune e inflamatoria, pero también vas potencialmente. Puedes interferir con la respuesta a patógenos o puedes interferir con la respuesta a tumores. ¿Okay? Por eso creo que conjugar y echar activation con mecanismos para inducir tolerancia antígeno específica es importante. Por eso nosotros hacemos las nanopartículas, ahora las, ya las cambiamos para que sean todas RNA-based. Esa es la forma en que yo creo que long term eh, se, va a, se puede convertir en una red of therapy. Y en general eso no es solo para echar, es la idea behind casi cualquier inmunoterapia para la inmunidad, ¿no? Que, que sí, obviamente, si, si bañas a una persona en esteroides no va a haber más autoinmunidad, pero vas a generar un montón de otros problemas. De otros problemas. Muchas gracias, doctor. Preguntas. Como todos, muchísimas gracias por la charla, creo que fue muy interesante. Eh, lo primero que, que, que me llamó la atención es el, el, los hallazgos con este herbicida. Eh, este herbicida, bueno, no sé, los toxicólogos seguramente tienen la respuesta, no sé qué tan, tanto se usa en, en México o en general en las poblaciones, eh, pero la pregunta específica es si el herbicida per se tiene un efecto proinflamatorio. Eso es importante. 
Solo es muy poco lo que ve. Lo que necesitamos, lo que necesitas es otro trigger. De hecho, eh, tratamos zebra fish y mice eh, con, solo con el herbicida y solo no puede hacer de trigger. Por eso creemos que va junto con la idea de que no, no tenés un solo estímulo, tenés una variedad de estímulos que te va a actuar en un eh, background que sea proinflamatorio, porque al fin y al cabo tiene que ser gente que tiene la genética que lo va a hacer hyper responsive. Bueno, en parte la genética está regulada por la microbiota. La microbiota es fundamental y la microbiota va a estar regulada por el cambio de alimentación. Por ejemplo, comentabas tú de, de, de la uh, migración de población rural a población urbana. O, yo he visto, por ejemplo, trabajos de, epidemiológicos eh, de la población japonesa. Eh, eh, cambio de dieta. Que, cam que cambian dieta cuando van al est a Estados Unidos y desarrollan eh, problemas inflamatorios eh, muy, muy graves a nivel intestinal. Y, y, es, y, y mi pre, la segunda pregunta va en relación a eso, precisamente. ¿Qué, qué tan bueno es el, este modelo de eh, utilizar aptenos para, para, literalmente, para decorar el intestino, causar inflamación? Porque el fenómeno es un fenómeno agudo y muchas de las, de las cosas que estás viendo es en un fenómeno agudo, cuando la, el IBD en humanos es un fenómeno crónico. Eh, no, desafortunadamente no conozco modelos en ratón para, para IBD crónico. Creo que sería ideal tener, contar con uno de ellos, pero ¿qué tanto se podría trasladar esta información? No sé si tengas alguna comparación con, literalmente, con pacientes versus lo que encuentran en ratones para, para validar el modelo como tal. Do, dos respuestas. Primero, para la primera parte, ¿no? Una de las cosas que nos interesaba es, o que nos preguntamos es si el propisamida te podía cambiar la microbiota podría potencialmente ocurrir. Y la respuesta es sí y no. Sí te cambia un poco la microbiota, pero si trasladamos esa microbiota a ratones no tratados con propisamida, no afecta en nada la capacidad de desarrollar colitis. Ah, la pregunta es sobre el modelo. Por un lado, nosotros validamos los findings en otros dos modelos distintos. Pero por otro lado, lo que es importante es este modelo de TMBS, lo que tiene de bueno es que drogas que se sabe funcionan en colitis andan y de hecho una de las cosas que mostré es comparamos estos Y-Bots junto con TNF blocking antibodies y intervene blocking antibodies que son los que están usando en pacientes. Entonces, con todas las limitaciones, y es lo mismo que decía ayer con modelos de MES, todos los modelos solo te van a recapitular una parte del proceso, pero para estudiar la desregulación de la respuesta inmune creo que es un modelo válido. Desde la segunda parte, eh, eh, me llamó También la atención. Cosa que vuelve con lo que habían preguntado antes, es un modelo policlonal. Por un lado vos puedes decir, sí, decorar con aptenos no es muy elegante, pero te da esa policlonidad, policlonalidad, no sé cómo se llama, que, que es más relevante a lo que ves en pacientes, a supuesto tener un, un TCA transgenic, que sí, tener todas, todas las TCA son específicas para hacer parte so work. Y de la segunda parte me llamó la atención esta relación del, del lactato con... Eh, la regulación con XBP1. Bueno, en primer lugar, el, el intestino, eh, creo que cada vez entendemos más, es un sitio que eh, acomoda a, a las células T de memoria. Que muchas de las células de memoria andan por ahí dando vueltas. Eh, de hecho, se pensaba que buena parte de los, de los nichos eh, donde se acomodaban estas células eran médula ósea, pero la verdad es que las mucosas están eh, resurgiendo nuevamente como el sitio importante. Entonces, al tener un efecto no específico, creo que ya lo preguntaba bien ella hace un, hace un momento, al tener un efecto eh, policlonal o no específico, ¿no se afectan otras respuestas en ese sentido? Sí, y eso es importante. Una de las cosas que hicimos fue tratar los ratones de la misma forma y hacer un challenge with, con salmonella, literalmente para ver si afectaba las respuestas eh, protectivas contra salmonella. Y no detectamos efectos significativos. Y lo hicimos cuando tratamos even daily, si tratábamos solo once a week. Eh, muchas gracias. Y la última pregunta tiene que ver con, quizá con, con unas células que no han sido mencionadas aquí, pero que son muy importantes. Son los difusitos B, por supuesto. Eh, XBP1 es fundamental para la producción de anticuerpos, para las células plasmáticas. De hecho, el, el bloquear, el noquear eh, el XBP1 eh, le pega la... Eh, no sé si han medido anticuerpos. O sea, en general, pues, y en particular en, en, en el... En la, eh, el tracto digestivo de, de, de estos ratones tratados con, eh, con su probiótico para ver si afectan 
la cantidad y la calidad de la producción de anticuerpos? La verdad que no los medimos, por dos razones. Por un lado, como te decía, no vimos efectos funcionales en cuanto a la resistencia a patógenos. Pero la otra cosa que es importante es que en, en EMES, que es lo que estábamos interesados, por un lado, ese modelo que te mostré es completamente diesel independent, ¿cierto? Y mismo en la enfermedad en sí, los anticuerpos no se cree que jueguen un rol patogénico. Se creía que jugaban un rol, pero después se descubrió que es otra enfermedad que se llama NMO, que es otro... En el contexto de MES, el rol de las visas, que es muy importante, es básicamente el de APCs. Son muy buenas antigen presenting cells, pero no anticuerpos. Adelante. Sí, yo tengo eh, algo de curiosidad en esto. El, eh, ahora ha habido un gran incremento de intolerancia al gluten. Y eh, se si, si sabe, eh, hay una inflamación en el intestino en esos casos. Eh, hay también generación de anticuerpos. Se mide el, no, la, la reacción contra el gluten. ¿Saben ustedes? Y no es una inmuno... Una, no está relacionado tal vez con el genoma o tampoco con una supresión como enfermedad. ¿Saben algo? Lo que hicimos fue, bueno, sí hay en, 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 en celiac disease, right? Sí, lo que hay es un HLA eh, association, que eso es genome tree. Lo que hicimos fue, mostré esas nanopartículas que usamos para hacer tolerancia a antígena. Entonces las usamos para generar tolerancia contra antígenos asociados al gluten. El en, en un mouse model de celiac disease, son todos pésimos. El problema es que muchos de esos antígenos gluten tienden a ser extremadamente insulóficos. Generar esas nanopartículas fue un eh, epítope eh, recombinante tomamos pedazos de los epítopes dominantes eso es lo único que hicimos creo que hay datos que están buenos ¿Cuánto? Y entonces se pueden diseñar clinical trials donde al paciente se le administra una terapia inmunotolerogénica. Después se le hace un challenge con una dieta con gluten y se lo puede seguir por dos semanas. Hay epítopes inmunodominantes. Por eso creo que es un modelo, una enfermedad de que más. El challenge es que hay, hay muchos epítopes. Sí, o sea, es es maestinia grave. Creo que, que, que muchas empresas que están haciendo inmunoterapia que usan esa Gracias y felicidades por las pláticas. Yo tengo una pregunta. ¿El, el endufa es una subunidad del complejo 1? ¿Se intercala y entonces se bloquea la, la cadena de transporte de electrones en la cadena respiratoria? Endufa es, es una subunidad alternativa del complejo 1, literalmente del complejo 1. Entonces, lo que hace es generalmente el complejo 1 eh, es parte del el electron transfer, ¿no? Está transfiriendo electrones y eso. Hay una porción de esos electrones que van a volver, van a ser reverse electron transfer. Y eso contribuye, el complejo 1 es una de las principales fuentes de empty rows, de mitocondrial rows. Lo que Endufa hace es actúa básicamente como un freno parcial. Entonces, simplemente lo que hace es, hay menos forward electron transfer, y entonces, por una cuestión de frecuencia, hay menos reverse electron transfer. Nos parecía que hasta había un incremento de la existencia. El radio, el forward electron transfer que terminaba en reverse electron 
nunca lo terminamos de, ni de cuantificar de una forma sólida para tratar de entender. Pero, por ejemplo, en cáncer y en otras y por eso también el proceso. Una última pregunta, doctora Sánchez. Hola. Eh, Francisco, muchísimas felicidades por tu plática, claro. Y bueno, tengo muchas preguntas y solo puedo hacer una. Voy a elegir de la última parte con respecto al, al, a la terapia con lactato. Entonces, venimos de unos ganglios linfáticos donde las células T han sido activadas y parte, o bueno, diferenciadas hacia TH17, TH1, etc. Y esas células viajando al intestino. Y en presencia del lactato comentas que habría una rediferenciación hacia células TR1, por ejemplo. ¿Esa es vuestra idea? No, lo que, lo que sabemos es que las tizas van a ser primed en, en los lípidos, ¿cierto? Pero para ganar el, el para comple completar el fenotipo efector y patogénico, que por ejemplo en tizas que te van a producir y ahí tienes que ser la expresión de GMCSF en respuesta a el 23, so on and so forth. Eso, que se sabe ahora, lo que hay datos muy fuertes, es que eso es controlled by the gut flora, y que eso ocurre en el gut. Si no, esas tizas que fueron prime, por ejemplo, IL-17 producing tizas, se quedan en el gut, pero generalmente se convierten en IL-10 producing IL-17 cells. So, they have the potential to become effector tizas, Yet that doesn't happen unless you have the gut flora. ¿Y, ¿Y tenéis idea de cómo el lactato podría estar regulando esta situación? Sí, lo que sabemos es que el lactato lo que va a hacer es va a interferir con la habilidad de las dendríticas de producir IL-23 para promover la diferenciación en tu full effect of uh -huh. y, y, perdón, <risa> algunas de estas células, eh, digamos, reguladoras, por ejemplo, imaginemos que se diferencian a células reguladoras con vuestro sistema, con vuestra metodología. ¿Sí podríais ver si estas células pueden llegar al sistema nervioso? Bueno, entonces, es, es lo, que alguien me había lo que me habían preguntado antes, ¿no? Con las efectoras sí lo vimos muy claro que eh, interferimos con la migración, con la diferenciación. No es que interferimos tanto con la migración, simplemente que al haber menos efectoras que se generan en el GAT, hay menos que entonces migrate out to CNS. ¿Cuál es el technical challenge? Es que IL-10, si, si haces fax por IL, para IL-10, es, es un dolor de cabeza. No es, un, es, un, no es una citoquina que sea fácil de detectar. La mejor forma para detectarla es usando un IL-10 reporter. Pero para hacerlo con el KED system, tenemos que hacer el back cross de IL-10 reporter con el KED. El problema es que los dos nos ocupan las mismas bandas. Los dos nos salen en, en el red, en el rojo y en el verde. Y ese es el problema que estamos teniendo a cuantificarlo. Sabemos que están en el, en el GAT y si nos fijamos en el CNS hay un incremento en IL-10 producing TR1 like this. No, no la pregunta es si vienen, son las que vienen del GAT o si de, vienen de otro lado, no te puedo contestar. Por eso es que no tengo el experimento para decirte esto es lo que nos hace. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Pues este, doctor Quintana, le agradecemos su visita. Creo que es un excelente marco para celebrar los 50 años del departamento y pues realmente se, espero que se sienta usted bienvenido en su departamento y tanto si ve esta vez su casa. Muchas gracias. Claro.